one situation that we commonly run into um, when we're doing chemical experiments is that we wind up with numbers um, and it's hard to tell how many digits we should keep from each one of these numbers. Um, let me give you an example of this. Um, let's say that we're trying to measure the speed of a, some kind of object and we know that speed oops, speed is going to be equal to the distance traveled divided by the amount of time it takes to travel that distance. Now, let's say that we set up the experiment and we use, I don't know, a uh, some kind of really long tape measure and we measure out 100 point zero meters and we sit there with a stopwatch and we measure the amount of time that it takes for the object to move 100 meters and it turns out to be let's say 30 point zero seconds and when I plug this into the calculator the answer I get back is 3.3333 and so on off into infinity and it turns out to be meters per second but the thing is how do we know where to chop that number off obviously we can't write all the threes down um, what is the proper number of threes to keep well it turns out not all of those threes are really meaningful to the experiment in fact having all those threes there is actually um, kind of giving a false sense of precision to the experiment. You see, if we put too many threes, that means that we're implying that we know the speed to that degree. Um, if we don't put enough, then we're not really um, expressing how much precision was in the measurement that we took here. So what we need to do is cut off this number at an appropriate um, spot. In this particular example, we cut it off at three point three three meters per second okay and that's our answer now how do we come up with that well the way we knew how to cut off the numbers uh, was based on counting significant figures okay now when we look at a value we can calculate, or not calculate, I'm sorry, we can, we can uh, count the number of figures that are in that value that are significant. And to do that, we need to follow a couple of rules. And the first rule is that all non-zero numbers are significant. Okay, um, so for example, a number like 352 will have three significant figures. Every one of those numbers is non-zero, the three, the five, and the two. Okay, therefore, those three values are significant. If we had a number like 3.568, all four of the digits that are in there are going to be significant, so this is going to be four significant figures. Now the second rule is that zeros um, between non-zero, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> zeros between significant figures are significant. So a number like 303, okay, the threes are significant because they're non-zero numbers, and the zero between them, because it's between two significant figures, is also going to be significant. So that's three significant figures. If I had a number like 
Okay, the 3 and the 5 are significant because they're non-zeros. And these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 zeros in between them are also going to be significant. So that's going to be a total of 7 sig figs. Which brings us to the third rule. And the third rule is that leading zeros are never significant. Okay. Um, what that means is that if I have a number like 0 0.0005, okay, the leading zeros are the zeros that we start off with. Okay, so starting from the left side, if we go from left to right, all the zeros on the left hand side there are going to be insignificant. Okay, so the only significant figure then is going to be the 5, which gives us one sig fig. Okay, if I have a number like 0 0.0062108, okay, those first zeros are leading zeros, and they don't count. So we're left with these guys, and the zero, of course, between the 1 and the 8 is going to be significant because it's between two significant figures. So this would be 5 sig figs. Okay, and then we get to the fourth rule. And this one is a little bit more complicated because it does have a caveat, and it deals with what's called trailing zeros. Uh, trailing zeros are the zeros to the right side of the number. And trailing zeros are only significant if a decimal point is present. And I'm not talking about the assumed decimal point that's at the end of every number, um, but rather an actual physical decimal point drawn. Okay, so an example of that would be if we had a number like 1,500,000. Okay, the numbers that, I'm sorry, the zeros that end the number, okay, are trailing zeros. So those five zeros to the right. Um, but there's no decimal point present. That's the only time a trailing zero is going to be significant. Okay, and what that means is that the only significant figures we have are the one and the five. So that's two significant figures. Okay, now if we put a decimal point in there, things change. So if I had 1,500,000, point zero, the moment I put that point in there, that decimal point, all the zeros that are at the end of the number are now significant. So it turns out everything here is significant. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay. Now what if we had a number like 0 0.0500? Okay, the 5 is obviously significant. The two leading zeros are never going to be significant. What about the trailing zeros? Well, there's a decimal point present. That means they're significant for a total of three significant figures. Okay, so how does this help us with our calculations? Well, consider this. If I'm doing a multiplication or a division operation, there's a rule that we can follow. And that is the number of significant figures in the result. should be the same
as the least precise measurement. Okay, so for example, when we were looking at the 100.0 divided by 30.0, okay, and we did the math and we came up with 3.33 repeating, okay, where we would cut it off is going to be based upon the number of significant figures in each of these values. Okay, the 100.0 is going to have four significant figures. The number 30.0 is going to have three significant figures, which tells us that the result, in other words, the answer, cannot have more significant figures than the least precise measurement. The least precise measurement is the one with the least number of significant figures. So even though these threes go on forever, this rule tells us to cut it off once we have three significant figures, counting from the left. Okay, so multiplication or division, this is the rule that we follow. Now this does not apply to addition and subtraction. Okay, when we're doing addition and subtraction, the rule is slightly different. The number of decimal places not significant figures. The number of decimal places in the result should be the same as the measurement with the least number of decimal places. So an example of that would be, um, let's say that we're adding 115.02 to 0 0.035116. Plug this into our calculator, and we're going to get 115. 0.235116. Now, if we look at these numbers here, we can see that the first value is only going to have one digit after the decimal point, so there's only one decimal place. Over here, we have a value with six decimal places, so we're going to be limited to the one decimal place, which is right there. So when we round this, we get 115.2. Now, I see it, you look at this and it's, it seems kind of strange. How can one number plus another number give us back the same number uh, when the other number is not zero? Uh, what this is telling us is that this number right here is so small that it's insignificant relative to the other number. In other words, any kind of error in this digit right here, and there's going to be error in the last digit of any measurement, is going to completely wipe out this value right here. So that's why this stays 115.2. Okay, and again, so this is how you deal with addition and subtraction.